programming on behalf of the Nantucket Athenaeum. Tonight we have a start market overview with Abby Day Molina. And Abby comes to us from the financial services professional with an international experience in banking, financial services, real estate, and insurance industries. She is currently with the Consumer Bank Santander as an associate director. Previously, she worked on their finance, marketing, and customer experience teams. She has also worked at Citizens Bank and Fidelity Investment in financial roles. And as mentioned, Abby's going to talk to us tonight about the stock market. And with that, I will get out of the way and let Abby take over. Okay. Thank you, Daniel. Thanks, everybody, for coming. As he mentioned, um, this is part of our financial literacy series. And we're going to talk about just a high-level overview of the stock market. We also have some upcoming sessions where we're going to talk about some taxes, different kinds of accounts. So um, feel free to tune into one of those as well. Um, the information I'm presenting today, as Daniel mentioned, is, is for the Athenaeum, but we use a lot of information from our um, public sources, the Exchange Commission and um, NASDAQ. So our agenda, what I wanted to talk about, and I want this to be interactive. So if people have questions or things you want to know more about, please feel free to, to interrupt, raise your hand, whatever. Um, we can definitely make it a conversation. But I wanted to talk about some key terms give you some basic stock types, some understanding of what those are, how the markets work, and then do a case study on um, GameStop, which I know has been in the news a lot. So this will just be helpful for you guys to understand what happened. So um, with that, I'm gonna start and go through some terms. So there's a lot of different terms with the stock market. And I think in general in finance, which usually it can be kind of intimidating and daunting. So I'm gonna go through some of these. And of course we have this all documented. So if you ever wanted to refer back to any of this, let me know and we can send you um, what we have here. But one of the key terms that we start with is, is market value. And it's, it's really, um, it's the price at which what we call security is trading and what can be purchased or sold. And Abby. what this means is it, Oh, are you sharing your PowerPoint? Did you share your screen? I am. I can people see my screen? Oh, sorry, I must not have been sharing my screen. Not a problem. We haven't even got, got going yet. Okay. Can everyone see this? Try starting the PowerPoint. It says you started sharing. Okay. Can anyone else see it? Try stop sharing and just try it again. Okay. Let me try it again. Sorry, people. No, it's a part of it. <laughs> Can you see that? Oh, it's so weird. It worked before. No worries. Bounce out of that, Abby, and I'll share, and you'll just tell me when to go back and forth. Yeah, that's that's fine. Um, I think you can start sharing, Daniel. How about that? Yes. So I was on the slide, the third slide. So um, as I mentioned, we were talking about market value. This is basically what, what something's worth in terms of the stock market, what it's bought and sold at. And then what's really important is it's what investors believe a company is worth, which what that means intuitively is the amount of shares multiplied by um, the amount, the current price in the market of those shares and then um, those numbers shares outstanding. So this is really just so you can understand for the stock market, this is why prices are constantly fluctuating is there are shares outstanding. And then it's always kind of a push and pull of what people think something's worth and then that kind of gap. So that's what um, the market value is. And, um, and so when you hear those terms kind of fair market value or if something is overvalued, it just means that it's it's kind of going that that push and pull back and forth with the um, 
the price on selling and buying. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Another important term is also is um, market capitalization. You hear this also abbreviated a lot as market cap, and it's the total dollar value of what we call all outstanding shares. And again, this is taking the amount of shares times the market price. And, and what it's used to is when you're talking about um, corporate size. And so why this is also important in the market and where you hear it a lot is there'll be something called like small cap or large cap. And so what that just means is large cap is larger firms. When you think of big firms, you know, like Apple, IBM, some of those bigger companies, those are what are large cap, mid cap or again, medium size. And then small cap is, is smaller companies. So really when people are talking to you about capitalization, it's really relative to the size of the company. And, um, and again, this, this will come up because there will be different types of funds that might base on um, the different caps. Like there might be a small cap fund or mid cap fund, large cap fund. And also there are different indexes or indices that will also be measuring like the um, population of small cap stocks, things like that. So again, this is really just to help you understand when you're talking about a company, it's really relative to the size. Next slide, please. Um, another important term, and this will come in when we talk a little later about GameStop, but when we're talking about different types of investors, institutional investors are what we call organizations that invest. And when you think about that, it might be, and these are bigger organizations. So when you talk about institutional, they're usually much larger investors as opposed to a person. So this can be in this example, you can see like pension funds, hedge funds, investment banks, um, insurance companies, depository institutions, which really just means like retail banks, um, endowment funds. So like one of the world's largest endowment funds is Harvard. These are examples of institutional investors and why they're important is because they're so large, they can make movements within the, the market. And this is just important for you to understand when um, there are usually, and again, not in the GameStop example, normally if there's big movement, it's usually related to these institutional investors because they have so much power because they are large. So if you think of the example of say Harvard's endowment decides to invest in a certain stock or certain type of fund, that would be more likely to affect the market than say me investing in that fund or stock. So this is, um, again, just to help you kind of understand when you're talking about scope and size, why, uh, why it's important. Um, next slide. Another one, this is important earnings per share when you're talking about results and financial results. And so this is the company's profit divided by their outstanding shares. And, um, and again, this comes up when you hear about like quarterly financial releases, different types of things that'll be in the news. And so in this example, if a company earned $2 million in one year and they had 2 million shares outstanding, then it means that their EPS earning per share would be a dollar per share. And um, that's just like a very high level understanding of it. But when calculated, companies will, will weight it because if you're talking about over a certain amount of time, the amount of shares they have might fluctuate. So it might be um, it might be an average, something like that. So in this, it says that the one year EPS is usually calculated by the change in earning per share. So if you think about each quarter, that's how you, you get to that um, financial metric. But usually the, the growth rate is important because when you're thinking about a company, you want to see the earnings per share obviously continue to increase at some some level. So that's why you'd want to know what a uh, growth rate was in the previous year, what is projected to be over the next year. And again, a lot of this is subject to to what's happening in the uh, the overall economy and the market. But this is just something that's helpful to understand if you're reading financials, you're, you're hearing these kind of terms that um, 
you know, what's the EPS of this company? That's where, um, where this term comes from. And, and again, if people have questions, feel free to interrupt. Um, another big term is um, OTC, which is the over-the-counter market. And so what this is, in the concept, it's talking about a decentralized market, but it just means that it's not an exchange market, but it just means that there might be different dealers who are dispersed throughout, and it could be any sort of geography, but they're not listed on a stock or derivatives exchange. So it's kind of like, it's not a black market, but it's kind of outside of those markets. So in this, it says they're linked by telephones and computers, but realistically, mostly by computer. But for something that's more niche and specific, it would trade in the over-the-counter market as opposed to something that is on like a stock exchange. Yeah. So um, when we're talking about stock markets and stock exchanges, like what does that mean? So one of the biggest, the, well, not one of the biggest one in the world is the NYSE, the New York Stock Exchange. And um, it's the largest ETF exchange and it has really developed trading technology. And in um, as of February 2018, it was over $30 trillion. It's definitely the biggest in the world. So most times if you're hearing major stock news, it's related to the NYSE. That being said, um, one of the other big markets is the NASDAQ, which actually is a, an acronym for um, the National Association of Security Dealers Automatic Quotation System, which is a mouthful. But it was founded in 1971 and it lists 5,000 common stocks. It's also very technology focused. So whereas the NYSE is the biggest and it has a little bit of everything, the NASDAQ is more kind of tech oriented. And um, it's also very high tech, it's like very innovative, market moving. You know, a lot of this with these big markets is nowadays, everything is so fast. Certain computers execute trades incredibly fast. So that's what is really important on these exchanges because time is of the essence of prices are always changing. So, um, so that's, those are the two major ones in the U S and, um, and I mentioned a little earlier, there are a bunch of different indices for uh, stock markets and probably the biggest and most common one is the Dow Jones industrial average. And it, measures the performance of 30 large companies that are listed on the U.S. stock exchanges. And so if you're, again, listening in the news, things like that, you'll hear about how the Dow Jones is doing. And this is talking about when we, we go back to the concept of market cap, large cap companies. The S&P 500 is the stock market index measuring 500 large companies that is again listed on the exchanges here. And it's probably one of the most commonly followed. So you'll also hear like, how is the S&P doing? And so if you look at this graph here, it's showing um, three different ones. It's showing the NASDAQ, the S&P, and another one here, which is the Russell 2000. It's showing their performance. And so you can see that, um, that like, for instance, the S&P is this dark blue line. You can see their performance. They're all highly correlated together, but you can see that this is showing how um, these top companies. So it's saying the S&P 500, which is 500 companies, the NASDAQ 100, which is 100 tech companies, and then the Russell 2000, which this is for small cap stocks. And it's the smallest 2000 stocks in what's called the Russell 3000 index. It was started by uh, the Frank Russell Company in 1984. It's maintained by FTSC Russell, but it's a subsidiary of the London Stock Exchange. So that is a more international view. But again, when thinking about this, if you look, the Russell is that yellow line. This is talking about small cap stocks versus the S&P is obviously talking about large cap stocks. And um, and if you look at this little graphic in the left, 
you can see that obviously tech companies dominate the S&P 500, but as the example, it's showing you like this dark blue is Microsoft, Apple, um, Alphabet, Facebook, Amazon. Those are the major companies that are in the S&P 500. Obviously these are all really large companies and they're, they're definitely tech oriented. So again, this is just giving you a bit of a flavor of what are the types of stocks that are in these different types of indices. So um, when talking about stocks, there's different types. There's common stock, which means that if you buy common stock, the owner of this stock can vote at shareholder meetings and they're eligible to receive dividends. And dividend is like a regular payout versus preferred stockholders. They, they don't have voting rights, but they also can receive dividend pay, payments and they'll get them before common stockholders. And so they have also priority if something goes bad with the company and it happens to go bankrupt or and its assets are liquidated. So again, just important to think if the risk is what would happen if the investment doesn't work out. Preferred stock is obviously more valuable than common stock because you get that preference. So um, and then talking about different types of stock, growth stocks are um, stocks that have the potential to grow faster than the average. Usually they don't pay dividends. And um, when people invest in them, it's, it's really in the hope that they will um, appreciate quickly. Usually these are types of things like startups, companies that aren't um, mature and well-established. And so the thought is it's kind of, it's not really well known, it's very new, but there's a lot of potential for this um, stock to grow quickly. Um, kind of on the other hand, income stocks usually pay dividends consistently and they're just known to have income. They don't really fluctuate a lot. An example would be like a utility um, company, you know, National Grid, something like that, where, um, it's pretty stable and they'll just kind of keep going, pay, pay the dividend. They're not gonna appreciate quickly or anything crazy, but at the same time, they're less risk that they're gonna kind of like bottom out. Um, value stocks have a low um, price to earning ratio, which what that means is they're just cheaper to buy than other stocks. And they can really be either growth or income. And a lot of this might be based on if they kind of fall out of favor when you, you hear about analysts and research, they might say like they're, they, have, they don't really think the stock's gonna be doing anything really well, or um, they, they aren't thinking positively about it. Usually people are gonna buy these types of value stocks thinking that um, the market doesn't hasn't adequately uh, like assessed the stock so that in instead their price might uh, come back up. And then um, blue chip stocks again, this is a common term you might hear. It's usually large, well-known companies which are solid history of growth. Usually they pay dividends. It's you know it might be Coca-Cola, something again that they're really well known. Amazon, something like that, and they usually will pay um, dividends. So again, nothing um, crazy there. So um, with stocks, one of the important questions is how can you buy and sell? So there are a lot of different ways. Um, you can do direct, something called a direct stock plan. And this, this might depend on who your employer is. Some companies will let you buy or sell the stock directly through um, through them. An example would be, which in hindsight wasn't the best, but it's a good example in that Enron would let you buy Enron stock and invest in it. And you could buy it directly from Enron. If you did that, you would have no money. But at the time, that was the concept was that you can um, buy stock directly from that you don't have to go through a broker or a, um, you know, a middleman. So don't, don't do Enron, or you can't, 
But, um, but I mean, if you work for a company, depending on what the company is, you might be able to, a good example might be like an engineering firm, something like that. I, I know somebody who works at Raytheon. What you can usually do if you work at a company is, let's say you work at Raytheon, you could buy Raytheon stock. And often if you work at the company, you might be able to buy it slightly below market. So it is a good opportunity, especially if, um, you know, you feel like it's a great place to work, good work, you know, work standards, all those things, then that might be a stock that you can invest in directly. You might get it slightly below market and, um, and it's a good opportunity. So um, usually if you, you, without having to go through the middleman, obviously it saves you on commissions, but you still might have to pay other fees, especially if you were to then transfer those shares to someone else or sell them and um a lot of companies if they do give you stock or allow you to buy it they're they're probably going to be some sort of rules and limitations they might have a minimum amount or certain levels so um i don't think they don't want you to necessarily think you could buy all the stock or they might not also kind of on the other hand might not want you to buy like one share so um usually also important to know is they they won't let you buy it at a specific price or time so usually it's kind of the reverse of the company will sell shares they might say quarterly weekly whatever it is and at a certain marketplace market price and then you can buy it but you couldn't say like hey next week on tuesday i want to buy this share like usually it's more restricted than that I know um, I worked for a different bank, Citizens, and and that was how it worked. I think you could buy you could buy into the shares annually, and that was just the way it worked. And the reason why a lot of companies will do that is so um, you are in compliance with the regulators and making sure that there is no appearance of um, insider trading or anything like that, where the the timetable is set by the company allowing you to buy the share as opposed to you because you could theoretically work at a company and know like, Hey, we have this really cool project that's coming up next month. I want to buy a bunch of shares. They're going to announce it in the news. That would definitely be a no, no and an example of insider trading. So um, that's one way you could buy stock. Another way is through um, these dividend reinvestment plans they usually allow you to buy more shares of the stock you might already you already own. And usually you have to sign an agreement with the company to, to do it. So um, this is dependent. So usually you have to check with your firm to see if you can do that. And if there is some sort of fee where um, there might be some fee, there might not. But usually you just have to check with the company directly. Or again, if you use a firm what it's going to cost you. And then again, um, you can obviously use a broker. There's discount or full service. It depends on the amount of services that they're going to be providing you. They can buy and sell shares for you for a fee, which is obviously known as a commission. And so the, the thought behind this is if you have somebody who's kind of doing this full time, they can um, use economies of scale to buy stock, things like that. Whereas, you know, you as an individual person might not be able to buy at a certain price, but if you have a broker, they could say, Hey, I'm going to buy a hundred thousand shares of this. And then, you know, they also would be managing the money for you. And then another way, um, to buy stocks is through a stock fund. And these are mutual funds that will invest in stocks. And they'll usually have some sort of you know, specific in investment objective or um, policy. And again, this is where I talked about earlier where um, there might be a fund that says like, oh, we, we it's like a blue chip fund or a lot, large cap fund, uh, value cap, um, a value stocks or um, mid cap. So those are some of the, the funds that like they might have like a certain type of stock that they're focusing on. And again, usually you can, um, get those through an investment firm or a broker. And um, so now we're gonna talk a little bit about the markets, how they work. 
there's a bunch of different things we're going to talk about. We're going to talk about public companies versus private, some of the different market participants, some of these specifics about types of order, brokerage accounts, and then purchases and sales, understanding what long and short mean, and then executing an order. So again, if people have questions, feel free to jump in. All right. So um, public companies, this is a term I'm sure you all hear a lot. They're um, really important to our economy. They definitely pay a major role in um, everybody's you know, savings, your 401k, any of your retirement, anything. And um, if anybody, if you have any sort of fund, which whether it's a pension or mutual fund, usually they're investing in public companies. And so you also can, of course, invest directly. And so being public means that it trades on a public market, they disclose their business and financial information to the public and they're subject to those public reporting requirements and um, they sell securities in a public offering such as an IPO. And then they usually will allow their investors to reach a certain size. And then it'll, based on the size that they get to, then that triggers more of this um, financial reporting, if you will. So um, some of the stuff that public companies need to provide, these are different forms, the 10K, which is the annual financial statements, the quarterly, which means is the 10Q, they um, provide their financials on a quarterly basis for, um, for the main three quarters. And then obviously the fourth quarter will be their annual. And then with the quarterly statements, the annual information is helpful, but obviously that's kind of like a long tail because a lot can happen in one year, which is why the quarterlies are also really helpful when you want to compare the performance of the previous quarter to the current quarter, but then also how they did in the previous year. That might be more relevant depending on the type of business. Some businesses are really um, seasonal. So then that that's helpful for you to understand like, okay, you know, their big time is the summertime. How did they do last year in the summer? Helping you understand their financial health. But then also seeing how they did quarter over quarter is helpful too, because, um, you know, is the best business making more money this quarter than last? Or if they're not, is there a reason behind it? Um, also, the um, the 8K, these are all reports that, by the way, are, are filed with the uh, SEC, the Securities and Exchange Commission. So if you ever want to find any of these, you can usually find them online or at, um, through the SEC's website. It's pretty easy to find. They are a little tough to read, but um, you can find relevant information. You can find how much money the company's making. You can find out how much their CEO makes, stuff like that. Um, another important piece is the 8K, which is usually if they're doing any major um, any major event, it might be obviously if a company goes into bankruptcy, but also if they hire, you know, a new CEO, someone who's high level in their management structure, or they're going to talk about their earnings, those will also be part of the 8K filings. And, um, and I have this little graphic over here. This is giving examples of like what's private versus public. So for instance, public obviously means it's on the major exchanges. But it's showing that like they have to file these reporting with the SEC. They have to, um, they're a lot easier to research. Their information is out in, um, in these public forums. Private companies, an example of this is like Dell. Their information, they don't have to file with um, the Securities and Exchange Commission. They don't have to release all their financial statements. So it just means it's harder for you to find information about that company, to find out how they're doing, how they're um, paying all their, their senior leadership, a lot of those things. It's just a lot harder to find that information. So when thinking about a company, if you want more transparency that's important to you, then you probably would want to be leaning towards a public company versus a private company where they may be doing the right thing, but they may not. And if they're not voluntarily kind of releasing that information, there's not any way for you to know. Um, another important piece is talking about proxy statements. What this means 
is this talks about the the voting of shareholders, which is really important with um, with the with when talking about the rights of like why you would want to be invested in a certain company versus not because you can elect members of the board of directors, you can cast votes on things such as executive compensation, which is, you know, are we paying this senior leader a ton of money or maybe not? Also, if they want to do some sort of merger, something like that, it's just, it's really important for you to have rights. You'll also hear about kind of activist shareholders and what it means is it's someone who might buy a lot of shares in a company with the aim and the goal of having more power over what the leadership is doing. And so when I think about an example of like activist shareholders, this in the um, you know past decade, one of the examples of this was Yahoo, where there were some activist shareholders who felt like Yahoo wasn't necessarily being managed the way they wanted. And so they bought um, stock to really become active in talking about the board of directors, casting votes, and really being involved in the strategic direction of the company. So um, that's important piece as well. Next, um, another important term, I know you hear it a lot is IPO. What is an IPO? It's an initial public offering. And what it is, it's a private company's first sale, sale of stock to public. Usually these are, but not always, it usually is kind of like a younger, newer company. And what they're trying to do is raise money and um, and become part of the public market. Usually there's a lot of risk involved because you can get large gains, but also you could potentially lose a lot of money. And um, when we talk about IPOs by investment companies, which are called close-end funds, usually um, there's a lot of fees involved and that is something that the buyers have to pay for. But like a lot of, you'll hear about an IPO where they'll project the price to be at a certain amount. And then if it goes above that, there's a potential to, to make a lot of money. Or if you're talking about a young company, there someone, you know, we can use Microsoft as an example. When they started Microsoft, there weren't a lot of people involved. And so when people were originally being involved, they would give them, rather than necessarily paying them, they say, okay, I'm going to give you a thousand shares in Microsoft, which as the company was starting out, wasn't worth a lot of money. But eventually when they did an IPO, if one share was selling for a thousand dollars, you could imagine that there's a lot of money to be made. So um, that's usually where, when you think about the potential for um, for the, the risk, that's where you could make a lot of money, but also you could think like, hey, our IPO is going to be huge. And then it just doesn't become as um, big as you think it's going to be. And then you, you won't make as much money. And other things that have affect IPO prices can be general market conditions, how the economy is doing. Also, one of the things that's tough with IPOs is if there are a lot of IPOs that keep happening that year, then you just might be like bad timing of like one of many. Whereas if there aren't a lot of IPOs and you manage to, to do your IPO, then it might just be great timing and people are really excited about it because there aren't a lot there. So there is a lot of variability and risk with an IPO just because of uh, those different pieces. Um, so the next thing we're going to talk about is, is something you'll, again, terms you'll hear are like market participants. And literally, it obviously means those who participate in the market. But um, the major players are usually what are called broker dealers. And those are the ones who do the trades between buyers and sellers. So of course, people can do it directly, but the majority is done by broker dealers. And um, and what they can do is, again, they'll have an inventory, a bunch of, um, you know, stocks that they might be able to sell to customer. Or you might have a customer who just says, like, hey, I'm looking for a large cap stock, but they might not necessarily have 
a specific stock in mind. And so if you're working with a broker dealer, they could say, well, you know, I have this stock. Do you want to buy this? Where they might have something specific in their inventory that they can offer based on what they have. The other um, important piece is clearing agencies. And so um, they have to register with the SEC and um, they have to, this is kind of one of the weaker pieces. They have their self-regulating organization. So they have to write and enforce their own rules and discipline members. So um, that obviously can be right for some issues because they're regulating themselves and anyone who knows self-discipline can only go so far. So um, that can be tough, but the main types of clearing agencies are clearing companies and depositories. And so the main um, clearing corporations, these are big organizations, the National Securities Clearing Cor Corporation, NSCC, in the Fixed Income Clearing Corporation. They, um, they compare their transactions, they do the trades for those who belong to their organization, and they um, prepare automated settlement. So they're usually intermediaries. And so again, when thinking about something like a clearing corporation, this is when you come back to the concept of institutional investors, because when they're talking about clearing transactions, automated settlement, this is usually something that's on like a larger scale. So that's why um, that's why it's important, you know, understanding these big organizations that will be doing huge trades in large volume. That's where there needs to be a certain amount of time to to clear the trades, to automate the settlement, like all of those different pieces. The depositories, such as um, depository trust companies, they hold the certificates for um, their, their participants and they'll transfer between their own um, positions and they'll have their own records. So depositories are usually smaller than these large, again, National Securities Clearing Corp Corporation. These are really big organizations. All right, sorry, this is really small font. So there's just a lot of info on here. Other important participants are the credit rating agencies. They obviously talk about the credit worthiness of a company or a security. So what this means is, and this is something when you think about, you'll hear something like triple A rated or investment grade, you know, double B, those, those types of ratings, those are done by these credit rating agencies. And um, they usually distinguish between something that's investment grade versus non-investment grade, which just means they're below what we call double B. So again, this goes to the concept when you hear someone say like, oh, it's triple A rated. It just means that it's, it's the best um, rating for credit. So they're, they're the lowest risk. And then kind of the other side of the coin is then those that are much lower rated, it just means that they're much riskier. And um, another important place you'll hear this is when people are talking about bonds. And again, it's just the, the likelihood of someone paying this back to them. So if you, you know, you buy a bond and it's highly rated, you're saying that you think that they are most likely going to pay it back to you. And so again, this will come up where you'll hear like something gets downgraded and it just means that the risk is increasing if something's downgraded. The risk that they will default and not pay something back in full will usually be why something would get um, downgraded from something such as AAA to, you know, AA, something like that. And um, these agencies are registered with the SEC. Other things more acronyms, ECNs and ATSs. ECNs just mean electronic communication networks. It's a way that um, people can trade electronically, their electronic trading systems, and they'll automatically kind of match different orders for um, different securities. And they also register with the, um, the SEC. And um, what the ATS is, is regulation for alternative trading systems. And it means these are just any of those trading systems that aren't 
um, registered with the SEC. So it's again, when we talked a little bit earlier about these kind of like niche markets, o OTC, alternative trading systems would be a way for you to trade within the over-the-counter market because it's not something that's registered with the SEC and regulated by them. And um, investment advisors, these are people who, um, the, it could be people or firms, and they obviously provide investment advice to investors. And you have to be licensed. There's a certain amount of testing and licenses you need to require in order to, to provide um, investment guidance. It's obviously done for compensation and it is regulated, but um, it's important when you hear the concept of like investment advisor, it just means that that person is licensed to give that type of advice. And um, the term security exchanges are markets where securities are bought and sold. As we talked about, it's um, the NYSE and the NASDAQ, but also there are some other exchanges such as um, the Ch Chicago Board Options, and the BATS exchange. So the Chicago Board Options, if you think about the price of say um, a lot of our like wheat, food products, things like that, those types of things are usually those, the pricing of those items is usually on the Chicago, Chicago Board Options Exchange. And um, an important thing to know is securities exchanges, they are self-regulated organizations. Why is that important? When um, I'm sure everyone remembers Bernie Madoff, who um, used to be the head of the NASDAQ and was obviously the um, leader of the largest Ponzi scheme we've ever heard of. He was part of a self-regulating organization. So that's where you can obviously see there are some loopholes of when you have to regulate yourself, if you are the one who is committing the crime, then you're not gonna be regulating yourself which is part of the problem of why someone such as Bernie Madoff was able to get away with it so long. So um, that being said, two of the larger, what we call self-regulatory organizations are known as FINRA and um, MSRB. FINRA is the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority and um, they're the largest in the securities industry. They are the biggest regulator of worker dealers. They, um, they are overseen by the SEC, but um, you know, they write and control their rules, how they discipline their members, all those different pieces. The other one, the Municipal Securities Rulemaking Board, MSRB, they're also, um, they regulate those who are dealing with municipal securities. When, when you're talking about municipal securities, usually you're talking about municipal bonds, things like that, where um, like a state might offer a certain bond or a uh, town, city, things like that. They're both, again, um, under the purview of the SEC, but they write and do kind of their own disciplining within um, within their organization. Um, another important term or participant in the market is a transfer agent. And they record changes of like when, um, when a security changes hands, the ownership, they make sure they maintain all the records, they issue certificates, they, they distribute dividends, all those different things. They're, again, an intermediary between the, the company that's issuing the security and those who, um, who actually hold the security. They also have to register with the um, SEC or if it's a bank with the FDIC. So um, when we talk about stock market orders, what does that mean? There's a couple of different, so I'm just gonna talk through some of these with you. One of them is a market order, which is when you want to buy or sell something immediately. It 
what it does is it does guarantee that it's going to happen, but it doesn't guarantee the price. And that's when you talk about like price settlement, like you can see you want to buy it at a certain price, but it's not guaranteed. It'll, it'll execute at the current bid or it'll ask for the current price, but the last traded price, the, tri the price you might see on the screen may not necessarily be the price that you'll, um, you'll get. And so this is important when we get into like GameStop where it was moving so quickly that you could have seen on the screen that GameStop was $200, but by the time your order was executed, it might've been 250, like it's moving so fast. That being said, um, there are kind of ways to protect yourself if you wanna only buy or sell something at a certain price. So I'm gonna get into that a little bit. So a limit order is a way to buy or sell at a specific price or better. And so this is saying you can only um, buy if it's at the limit price or lower. And then the sell is that you'll only sell at the limit price or higher. And so in this example, you want to buy Amazon and you say no more than um, $10. You would, you, if you went to the market, it was $11 you wouldn't buy it, you would, it would wait until it's $10 and then your order would be executed. And then a stop order is kind of the, the reverse, which is that the order to buy or sell once it re reaches a certain price, which is a stop price. And so again, this could be if like with GameStop, you had bought it and then you're saying, well, I don't wanna buy or sell it if it um, goes any lower than X. And you can say that was $100, whatever it is. So these types of orders are just kind of protecting you if you have certain prices, like you might have a level of flexibility with your pricing, then um, then that then you put usually these types of orders on your trade so that you make sure that if a stock is in free fall that you're not, you know, you might say the most I'm willing to lose on my Amazon stock is, you know, once it goes hundred dollars, I don't want it anymore. Things like that. And a uh, um, and a buy stop order is a stop price above the current market. And so this is again to limit a loss or protect on a uh, profit of a stock if you stole if you sold short. And then I'll talk a little bit about short selling and long in a minute. But it's a sell stop order is entered at a stop price below the current price. So again, this would be if you had bought GameStop at 150 and you're saying the the pro the sell stop is for you might be a hundred dollars. So it's not at that price yet, but that's your order of you're gonna sell it once it reaches that. So um types of brokerage accounts. There are a couple different accounts. There's a cash account, which um, the investor just pays the full amount for whatever stocks you're buying and selling. You're, you're not allowed to borrow money from your broker to buy uh, more stock. So it just means like if you have $5,000, that's all you got. You can buy and sell within that amount of money, but you don't have any more wiggle room. A margin account is a type of account where um, you can buy and sell, but you can have something that's kind of like collateral for loan. And so you obviously have to pay interest, different things like that. But what you can say is it gives you a little more flexibility, especially with changing pricing that you, you might be able to buy or sell a little bit more than if you have just a straight cash account. And so if you're thinking about it, it's, it's kind of similar to the concept of a cash account is like your debit card of you can only pay with what you have, whereas the margin account is more along the credit card concept of like you get a little more flexibility and you have to pay for it later. So obviously there are risks involved with purchasing on a market margin if you, um, you know, if you buy on a margin and the value declines, they might the firm can come and ask you to pay it off or deposit money immediately. It also can sell other securities within your account to, to cover it. And they don't necessarily have to tell you. So you have less 
control over the actual securities within the account because they might be like, okay, I bought you all this GameStop and I had to sell your Apple stock. And you might be like, well, I don't want to sell my Apple stock. It's my favorite. And they'll be like, well, you owed money on it. So it's like you have less, um, you have less power over that. And even if they let you know it, um, they, they usually have to let you know after it happens. So they still wouldn't tell you ahead of time. So you can't really do much about it. And, um, and they can also change, they can change the thresholds with the mar margin accounts. So that's where it's just important to know if you're going to be investing in that, that it is a little riskier. Um, so I mentioned a little earlier, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, long and short. What a long position means is that um, you own the security and it's, you expect that the price of this security is gonna rise in the future. Obviously this is the, op the opposite of a short. A short is the sale of a stock you don't own. Usually investors will short stocks because they think the price will drop. And so what it means is if, if the price does drop, you can buy this stock at a lower price. And if the price rises, you buy it back at the higher price, but you lose money. So um, short selling is, is done with the experienced investor. We'll talk a little bit about this in GameStop, but that was why it was so important with um, GameStop in that GameStop was a stock that people generally thought was going to be falling. So they thought that... Um, they shorted the stock, believing that they would be able to buy it at the lower price later. And so um, they're normally, on the right-hand side, it's a little more detail about it, but short short sales are normally settled by when you get the security, but the one that's borrowed. And then the investor usually closes out the position when they uh, buy it in the open market. So you're saying like, I think the stock, it's at 20 now, I think it's gonna to go to 15. When it goes to 15, you close out your short by just buying it at the $15, which is what you expected. And then that incremental difference between 20 and 15, the five, that's what you get as, um, as your profit. So again, that usually people short stock because they think the price is gonna fall and they hope to buy it at the lower price and make that profit. It's Used by what we call market makers. Again, these big organizations, institutional investors. And um, what it does is it does provide liquidity. What that means is it just means that there's more freedom in cash in the market. And um, when something that's unanticipated happens, or you are doing the opposite of like hedging a risk with a long position, where um, like you might say, I think Amazon's going to go up a hundred, but if you're not sure, you might short another stock. And that way, if Amazon only goes up 50, but you shorted another stock, you're kind of like netting it out. So that's why people will short certain stocks and then be long on others. And, um, but then obviously the real risk with shorting is you think this price is going to go from 20 to 15, but instead it goes up to 25 you are losing, you have to pay the higher price. You have to pay the 25 and you could have bought it at 20. So then um, that's a loss for you. And um, usually firms lend to customers who engage in short sales using their own inventory and they do it on margin. But obviously they're subject to the th same thing we just talked about, margin rules and fees. And then... Um, even if you short a stock and it pays a dividend, even if um, like your short doesn't work out, you still have to pay uh, that dividend. So it is it is riskier. And obviously that's why usually more experienced investors are the ones who are involved with it. And so um, executing an order, what does that mean? It says when you, um, when you buy or sell the stock, you might not think about how it's actually executed, but the important reason why you need to think about this is it just, it will impact how much you end up paying. And, um, 
and like how it affects the market. So one of the important rules to know is it's not instantaneous, even though everybody thinks it's instantaneous. We have the internet, everything's so fast, nothing is instantaneous. And especially those who trade online, they think they have like a direct connection with the markets, but nobody does. Even when you send it over to your broker, it, it does take some time. And it's either even you're selling, calling it in, whatever that is. Usually it's pretty quick, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't happen instantaneously. Again, this is important when prices are changing really quickly in fast moving markets. And again, price quotes are only for a certain amount of shares. So you may not receive the price that you see on the screen when you're online. If you're talking to somebody, just it's always important to know that the price can change. And um, the SEC does say that they have to be, a trade has to be executed within a certain amount of time. And most firms will tell you what that is, but, um, but it's also important to ask that question up front and be aware, you know, if I want to trade something, you know, if I put in an order today, like how long does it take? Does it take an hour? Does it take a day? Whatever that is. It's just important for you to know that because especially with something that's moving really quickly, Again, you just need to be aware that you're not going to get the exact same price. Um, and again, working with a broker, it's also important to know the broker has options. They can do a couple of different things. They, um, they might, if it's listed on exchange, your, your broker might go to that exchange, to a different one, or to a firm that we mentioned, a market maker. It's like a bigger firm. They're, they have a lot more power. They, um, they will be ready to buy or sell the stock on any exchange. And usually, and it's important to know this, that a market maker will pay a broker. And, it, and it's something, it's called payment to, for order flow, but it's just important it is a form of commission in that they're paying them to, to execute your order with them. So again, it's just so you are fully understanding that no one is kind of like agnostic or being altruistic. They like your broker will be going to somebody because they're getting paid something for it. <laughs> and, a, and a penny might not sound like a lot, but if they're literally directing thousands or millions of shares to that market maker, you can see how that ends up being a lot of money. And for a stock that trains, we talked a little bit earlier about the over-the-counter market. The um, the broker may work with the over-the-counter market maker, and they again can also pay for the order flow. And um, and the broker can also order through what what we talked about there, an ECN, an electronic communication network, that'll automatically do it. So that might be with something that's smaller, but again, if it's a much bigger trade your broker could theoretically shop it around to see who's going to pay them the most for your trade. And um, they may, they also may sell it again, full just transparency. If your broker is at a certain firm, they may also sell it within their own firm because then they get money off of that too. So again, it's just important for you to be fully aware that there are these different options, but that when someone is executing a trade for you, they won't always be looking for the best price for you. They also might be looking for what's best for them for how they make money. And the important reason why to know that is when a lot of these financial um, disputes arise, and I actually read a great article today, which I would recommend to people about this family where um, the matriarch who's 95 her grandsons worked at um, at JP Morgan, and they were executing trades and making millions of dollars off her investments. But they were doing different trades and things like that, not making her the most money because what um, they the Finra, the financial institution that regulates um, organizations such as JP Morgan's trades. What FINRA found was that if they had just kind of left her investments in basic mutual funds, things like that, she would have made more money than her grandsons kind of like doing all these crazy trades, moving all this money back and forth. But again, the reason why they did it was 
they were making more money and making more commissions by doing a lot of that movement. So again, it's just important to, to be fully aware and understand the motivations of the person you're working with. All right, and so um, that being said, your broker does have the duty of best execution. There are, um, most firms use automated systems that handle um, different orders. When they decide how to do it, they're, they're supposed to use best execution reasonably available. They should evaluate the orders it receives from all customers in the aggregate, so together, and then assess with the market the different um, organizations to get the most favorable terms of execution. So an opportunity for what we call price improvements, important that um, brokers should take it into account. It's an opportunity, but it's not a guarantee at all that an order can be executed at an even better price. And, um, and again, the, any additional time may result in you getting a worse price than the, the special quote you're getting. So usually the broker has to consider the trade-off between kind of like shopping something around and then, um, and then getting the best price. So that's where um, that's where this kind of comes into play. Where I'm saying your your broker can shop something around, but they should be getting you the best price. And um, that being said, you do have the option, so you can direct certain trades. Like if you want your broker to only use a certain exchange, a market maker, network, those things you can tell your broker like, hey, I only want you to trade on the NYSE. I only want you to use ECNs, like whatever it is. You can tell them that, but usually they will charge you a fee for like kind of being hamstrung within that, but it is an op option for you. So um, this is the case today I wanted to talk about was um, GameStop. I know everyone knows about this. This is what was in the news. And so what this, a lot of why, why this is relevant is um, it really pitted a group of retail traders against these large institutions such as hedge fund managers who had shorted the stock. So a little background of um, GameStop for everybody who doesn't know it. GameStop is kind of like a, it's a retail um, video game store Anyone who knows a lot about, especially during the pandemic, um, but even in the last decade, malls have, have begun to fall out of favor because people's shopping habits have shifted and a lot more people buy online than they did before. So why this is important in the markets is people for a long time have been shifting away from investing in retailers because it's hard to see in the future that they will make as much money as, as they do now. That being said, there are some retailers who still are really profitable. An example I think of is um, like TJX, TJ Maxx. That company is still um, incredibly profitable, even though um, it is an in-store in retailer, but a lot of in-store retailers had kind of fallen out of favor. So it's just important to know that that was kind of like the general consensus. So what this means is these large firms, such as um, these hedge funds, started to take and often do take. They might take a long position. They might take a short position on firms that are in malls, and it's not just GameStop. They might be like, "I'm going to short GameStop." Claire's, you know, American Eagle Outfitters, you could think of like any of those stores, especially because if a, um, a retailer doesn't have a robust online presence or plan for managing that. And again, we're talking about these large firms that are really involved with understanding the strategic direction of these types of companies. They'll say, okay, I see that GameStop really relies on, you know, people coming to the store and buying games. It's just not going to be happening. So they decided to, to short, and they had been for a long time, GameStop. And, and don't feel bad for the hedge funds. They already made tons of money on GameStop because they've been shorting it for a long time. 
But what happened was this group of activist retail traders on Reddit, on this forum, decided to say, you know what? We should start buying up stock from GameStop because these guys have taken these really short positions and they're they're betting the price is going to keep falling and GameStop had been falling for a really long time. And if we suddenly start buying shares, the price is going to start going up. And this is Again, this example of the first one of the first cases we know of a stock going viral because it took a couple of days to go from nothing to really, really high. And so, again, also what's important in this concept is is the limited time off of, of why supplies last because it's an unsustainable um, concept of just suddenly pumping up the price of a stock. And so, knowing it is fleeting, it's only a certain amount of time, people definitely felt like they had to commit. And then it makes it even more desirable because everybody had it. So um, so that being said, all of these retail investors, such as um, Roaring Kitty, if you will, I think that's his name, they started pumping up. Um, and in the person I'm talking about, Roaring, Roaring Kitty, one of the, um, the retail investors, he had bid for a long time been um, trying to build up GameStop stock to not much success until this really started to take off. So what happened was um, the price started to rise really quickly. And so with these hedge funds, they um, some of them lost a ton of money. Example is um, Melvin Capital. They lost four and a half billion dollars on hedging that the price was going to fall. That's obviously a ton of money. Um, some hedge funds had a lot of issues because it wasn't just Melvin. I think there were a bunch of funds that had similarly made this bet that they thought GameStop's price it, price was going to go, but not just that, but then the the speed at which the price increased. I mean, we don't even know where they bought in, but if the price went up from... 20 to 150 and you had hundreds of thousands of shares, it's a lot of money. Um, but that being said, not every firm had um, lost a ton of money. So I use Melvin Capital. They're an example. They lost a lot. But um, Sunvest Management, that's another firm, they made 700 million because they had gone long where they had bet that the price was going to go up. And um, that being said, you think about that, like why would any firm do that? Sometimes firms, especially if we're thinking specifically about game stuff, they might say, well, you know, I know PlayStation is a new PlayStation is coming out or a new Xbox is coming out. And so with um, a firm like GameStop, they might have taken a long position because they thought that something was coming or they thought it's a pandemic, people are playing more video games, who knows what it is, but they taken a long position. So they obviously made a lot of money. But um, in terms of individual investors, they um, they definitely lost money shorting the stock or um, buying it before it fell back to lower prices. So buying it at like a higher price. So people, um, definitely regular people lost a lot of money, but there's a lot of people who also made some money who jumped in early, bought the stock and then sold at, um, at a really high price. So that being said, what, what's happened now, um, the price is now down, um, 80 per 90% from the share peak price. So, uh, the stock has definitely fallen back to normal. And I mean, we should expect it to kind of continue along. I want to say in the last month, it's lost another 80% or it's 80% of what it was. So the price correction is kind of coming into play. But um, why something like GameStop is really important is just, it's a microcosm of what happens in the market where you see how the prices can change super quickly and how something, especially in the media, if it goes viral, it can pump up. And, um, and you can see how it affects, you know, pricing so fast. 
And so that's why it's a good example of a way for you to understand like how the markets work of like, that's crazy. People think it's going to fall and then it doesn't. And then that's how a lot of people made money. The unexpected pieces. Yeah. Everyone thinks it's going to go down and then it suddenly goes up. So that is if, but it also shows that that is why um, shorting stocks is usually done by these experienced retail um, institutional investors because they can afford, if they did lose some money, they can usually afford to lose it. If you were just a regular person, you put your savings into it and you had shorted it, you would have lost all your money and you wouldn't have a remedy for that, which is why we don't recommend you know, average folks who don't have the knowledge to be doing this type of activity. But that being said, what um, I would encourage people to do is, is more like I try to think about when I think about stocks, more like larger trends. And, and that's where you can think about something such as a pandemic of, you know, maybe think about your everyday life. Like I think about, hey, you know, stocks that would have been when the pandemic started, like Zoom or, uh, you know, electronic communications, maybe um, Microsoft because they run Teams and like my company, all these companies are using those tools now, like more virtual communication tools. Or um, if you think about another stock people got crazy about, not to the level of GameStop, but like Moderna with the vaccine, there was a lot of stock kind of arbitrage with different companies of who's going to come up with the vaccine. And then their, their share prices were also fluctuating a lot. But then if you think about something like that, maybe a better place to invest your money is rather than trying to hedge your bet on who would be developing the vaccine is putting your money in um, companies that produce um, cooling agents, such as like carrier, things like that. So I think it's just important to, to, if you're thinking about investing more, just like doing your research, thinking about industries you care about, talking with, understanding more about um, how the stocks are doing. And then if you're looking at past performance, again, a lot of those different pieces, that's really where um, the value can be is, is saying, you know, I really believe in this type of stock and then finding what, you know, might be the right one for you. But again, always talk to the professionals. They can help you. So um, I don't, I think this is my last slide. So this is a little background about me. Um, I've done some work on studying economies. I, um, I analyzed the US and Japanese markets, the correlation after um, September 11th. I, um, I have a master's in finance from Boston College, the Carroll School of Management. And I did coursework with investments and hedge funds, and I wrote my thesis on exchange treated funds. But um, I work at Santander, I'm associate director. I've been volunteering for about the past years, and I do various financial literacy seminars here with the Athenaeum, but um, I've done them with other organizations as well. So happy to um, provide information, but I don't know if anybody has any questions, please feel free to ask happy to answer anything and there are no dumb questions. All right. Let's see here. If you're shy to chat uh, to talk, you can also put it in the chat. <laughs> I want to say If not, you can always, um, I did include my email. So um, you guys can always reach out to me, but I'm happy to um, talk to you more or provide you more details. Oh, someone has a question. It's um, what type of company is Robinhood? So um, that's a good question. Robinhood is, and this is a good one because it also has recently come up in the news. So Robinhood is actually a, um, it's an investment app or it's a, it's a platform. 
And so it's a way for you to kind of trade. It's similar to, I think the one that we've seen a lot in the news is like E-Trade, but it's a way for you to trade without commission fees. So it's just like, it's a cheaper way for you to do that. But um, it's a trading investment app, but why it's been in the news is what happened is unfortunately this Robin Hood is not as regulated or self-regulated as it could be. And um, and as with any investing, that's why it it's important to understand what you're doing. And in the example of the news is there was this young man, he was, I want to say 17, and he was he was doing shorting and trading and he didn't understand. And at some point he had a trade that had executed where um, it looked like he owed $700,000. And this is a high school kid. And the trade hadn't, again, when we talk about nothing's instantaneously, it hadn't fully settled. And so he literally thought he owed that amount of money and he ended up committing suicide, which is horrible. But the reason why this is in the news is his parents are suing Robin Hood because Robin Hood did not actively disclose to him what the trade was, what the timing was. And so again, that's why I'm saying it's really important to be educated if you are doing some sort of complicated financial arbitrage that you're either doing it with a financially licensed professional or that you know what you're doing. But this is why this is an example of that's a really horrible, like very... um, graphic example, but I think with a company like that, if you don't understand the type of trade you're doing, that's why um, that type of thing happened. So um, another question that might come up is sometimes when when you're thinking about like researching companies, like where do you start? So there are a lot of different um, ways for you to start. Usually the way if I'm trying to research a certain is is kind of like starting out if there's an industry or a type of company you're thinking about. So I'd use like an example. So something that I really enjoy is like running. So I could be like, oh, I'm going to look into companies that are, um, you know, running shoe companies. So then, um, you know, you really kind of narrow it down where you start start large. And so it's like, okay, running, do I want apparel? Do I want like companies that provide technology? Like, what is it? And so you can take this like a couple of different directions, but I said like, okay, I'm going to go with apparel. I'm going to go with running shoes. What are the big running shoe companies? And so um, you could be like, oh, it's New Balance, but um, an interesting company that would have been like a good one for investing in research is this company called Allbirds, which was started by a um, New Zealander who was a professional soccer player who um, New Zealand is the largest exporter of wool. And he decided that he didn't have really great sneakers for him to play um, soccer and rugby in. And so he ended up deciding to, to start his own company because um, one of the great things about wool is that it is um, like a sustainable shoe product. And for those who don't know, shoes are some of the least recyclable products on the planet. So like, that's an example of a company that you kind of go down that, that hole of studying all of those different things. And that would get you to the place where you're like, okay, cool. All birds. That sounds like a company I'm interested in. So I think when, when doing research is really kind of start starting broad and then narrowing it down to really to your focus of like, what is the different type of area? And then once you get there, there's a lot of different um, financial research tools you can use. Um, there's a lot of resources out there for finding out about different companies. If you know where it's exchange, for instance, you can start by looking on the exchange and they'll have a background about the company. If the company's public, then you can do the research to find out about their background. You can find out their financials, um, all of those different pieces. But there's usually... Um, And again, with public companies, it's easier to find information because they do have to do certain kinds of disclosures and they're out there. So also kind of figuring out, do you want to go with public companies versus private? But, um, you know, there's also a lot of great um, financial research tools. You know, there's companies you've heard of, Forbes. There's um, 
a lot of different um, places you can go on the internet, like all sorts of those. I'm gonna, there are firms that will um, do research for you. You know, you can look at um, Fidelity, different companies. You can obviously talk with an investing advisor who will provide you information, but you can do some of your own research, you know, just basics. Um, just searching on on their background. And again, if they're public, you can get it through the SEC and the um, exchange that they're traded on. Any Are more any questions? questions? Anybody? Don't be shy. Got about five minutes left. Buddy. Well, we thank you all for coming. Yeah, thank you guys. And of course, um, Daniel, if you just want to reshare the last page so people have my email, if you have questions, please um, don't hesitate to reach out. I'm happy to um, answer any questions or um, yeah, my email, uh, maybe, if, I don't know if you can scroll down a little might be covered. Yeah, so that's my email, abby.demolina at gmail. Feel free to reach out to me if you have questions. I'm happy to answer. Um, I live in Nantucket on uh, Friendship Lane, so I'm easy to find. But um, also happy to always um, answer any questions. So thank you all for coming. And, um, and as I said, in two weeks, we're going to do another session. If there's something you want to hear about, also that might not be stock related that's fine just let us know and we can also you know we have some upcoming sessions that we're working on so we can still incorporate some of your feedback too okay everybody thanks for coming right. great thank you guys have a great day evening